Welcome to another episode of Playing with Research in Health and Physical Education. Uh, Risto here. Um, we're talking to Dr. Michael Hemphill today. Uh, and this podcast is actually a combination of a couple different models, teaching personal social responsibility and restorative justice. Uh, I think it's great for uh, those of you who are interested in um, restorative justice, whether it's in a uh, physical education setting, a coaching setting, a classroom setting, or after school. Um, I hope you really enjoy this and uh, hopefully uh, we get some good feedback from here. Thanks. Hey, we're here with uh, Dr. Michael Hemphill uh, from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Uh, we're discussing his article titled Restorative Youth Sports, an Applied Model for Resolving Conflicts and Building Positive Relationships. Uh, it was published this year in 2018 in the Journal of Youth Development. So uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for the opportunity to be on this podcast. I'm really excited about the podcast and I've enjoyed listening to the episodes you posted so far. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who contributed to this work, which include Emily Yonke. She is a scholar administrator at UNC Greensboro and our two friends from Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand, Barry Gordon with the Faculty of Education and Haley Fair with the Center for Restorative Justice. Awesome. Um, so let's get right into it. I, I like to start off with some definitions first. So can you give us a definition of what sport-based youth development is? Sure. So sport-based youth development, or SBYD, uh, aims to provide physical activity and sports programs to kids in a way that prioritizes the development of personal and social skills that can be learned in a sports setting, but also applied in other areas of their life. So a common example of an SBYD program uh, might be a youth leadership development program that gives kids an opportunity to practice leadership in a sport context, but also to think about how they can be leaders in their communities or in their schools. It sounds like a strengths-based approach. Um, now, what would you say that the majority of sport-based youth development programs are missing? Yeah, I agree that it tries to build on the strengths that youth possess rather than focus on their deficits. As a result of that focus, I think teaching conflict resolution skills has not been a prominent piece of SBYD programs. This can lead to teaching youth implicitly or explicitly that conflict should be avoided and limits the space available to help them sort out the conflicts that they're facing in their life. Great. So this specific study that you did, uh, can you give us the purpose of it? Yeah. So going into the study, we recognized that there's an opportunity to expand our thinking about how to address conflict in sport-based youth development programs. And so we sought to develop a framework for doing that. From the outset, we recognized that restorative practices may provide a framework for teaching conflict resolution skills and that this would connect well with existing sport-based youth development models. Now, in the paper, you talk about two, um, two major frameworks, TPSR and, um, and you talk about restorative justice. So we know that TPSR has been around for a while as a curriculum model, and um, Don Hellison really pioneered this and developed this. Um, and there's been a lot of research on the implementation of this model and the positive effects it can have on youth. Can you give us a brief overview of the um, of TPSR? Yeah, so just briefly, I would say that there are three aims of TPSR, and that includes to empower youth to be responsible in their own conduct and to be responsible in the way they treat others. And then finally, to apply those personal and social skills in other areas of their life. Uh, that third one, a lot of people will refer to as transfer of learning. There's several specific strategies provided to guide practitioners in their use of the TPSR model, things like a lesson plan format, some reflection tools, and many research articles. It's a growing area of scholarship. That information is all freely available through the TPSR Alliance at their website, tpsr-alliance.org. And I know that's an awesome, um awesome venue for for a lot of professional development as well so we'll link to that in the in the podcast notes below you do, 
You also do a really good review on restorative justice and restorative practice in the paper. Um, can you give us a brief overview or explain those quickly? Yeah, so just briefly, um, restorative justice is a relational approach to addressing serious violations. It tries to shift the thinking on conflict resolution to focus on the harm done to relationships rather than the punishment of the offender. The term restorative practice is, is a much broader concept that is more applicable to school and youth settings specifically. It builds on that same concept, the idea that rural violations cause harm to relationships, and it's important that relationships be restored. So moreover, restorative practices recognizes the normalcy of conflicts and human relationships and embraces that as a way to build positive relationships through conflict resolution. There are several specific strategies that restorative practitioners can use to address conflicts that occur, some of which will come up in this podcast. And I know there will be a separate um, but complementary podcast that goes into restorative justice and restorative practice in a little bit more depth in this series. Yeah, and I think that's a great explanation that you do in that uh, in that shorter podcast, just focusing on that uh, on that piece. So we do recommend that the listeners um, have a have a listen at that as well. So in this specific. Uh, research study, you partnered with some great people in New Zealand and took on a community engaged approach. Can you explain what a community engaged approach is? Yes. Um, community engaged scholarship aims to transform the participant relationship in a research project into a partnership. So, where community partners are involved with uh, all aspects of the research and have some reciprocity in decision making. Uh, seeking mutually beneficial outcomes that are helpful to the research team, but also helpful to the community partners and giving them a, a voice through the duration of the study. So, for example, all aspects of this research, including uh, and analyzing the results, were developed in concert with our partners. And, I, and we get back to this a little bit later on, but... Um... You went all the way to New Zealand for this. So why did you have to go all the way to New Zealand um, from North Carolina to do this work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so Howard Zare is a leading scholar on restorative justice. And he was quoted as saying once, if you wanted to see what restorative justice could look like in the United States 20 years from now, you go to New Zealand today. So for example, New Zealand currently has over 200 public schools that their Ministry of Education classifies as restorative schools. So this was an opportunity to build on their strength of restorative practice and try to understand how that might, what that looks like in other contexts such as sports. And so who are the participants in this, in this study? We ended up having 36 uh, participants. That included university professors and researchers, physical educators and sport coaches, a couple of police officers, teachers and administrators, restorative justice practitioners, and youth development professionals. A few of those participants uh, had, had dual roles. For example, a uh, school teacher who also coaches in a sports program or a restorative justice practitioner who's, who was a police officer. Great. The community-engaged scholarship approach is very different than what maybe a person would have learned in a research methods class of how to conduct research. So the methods looked a little different. Can you give us a little bit of rundown of what the methods look like in the, in the study? Yeah, so after each participant was interviewed, they were given opportunities to enlist in the research program. The first way we did that was to ask them questions like, who should we be talking to to learn more about this work? and let them give us recommendations and ask them what questions should we be asking to get the appropriate answers uh, to this issue around restorative justice in sports. Several participants assisted with developing a framework for thinking about how restorative practices apply to sports. We also followed up with participants after we left New Zealand um, to ask what they would like to see happen as a result of their involvement in the partnership. Most of them were really interested in reviewing the results that we came up with. So we compiled the results that you see in the paper 
on a Google site and provided that to all participants to provide feedback. That also helps serve as a member check strategy for our data analysis, which in qualitative research helps add to the trustworthiness of the results. Now, as a side note, as a qualitative data analysis nerd, you also invited them to be a part of the coding process. And surprisingly, nobody, or not surprisingly to me, nobody uh, joined in on that data coding process, but you actually invited them to be a part of the data coding. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So we in invited all participants to be involved with all aspects from the design of the study through the presentation of the results. Um, most of the participants, I think, saw themselves as very uh, engaged in their workspace and not as interested in being involved with the coding process. But we did put that out as an opportunity, including providing strategies where they could collaboratively code um, data with us. And there's other research and community engaged scholarship where that type of process does take place where participants help code the data. I think that's awesome. I think that's very different than a traditional go in, you know, work on data or, you know, even traditional quantitative or qualitative research studies to in involve them. So, all right. Um, so in your results section, uh, you start highlighting the missed opportunities and maybe the potential for restorative practices to be integrated into sport-based youth development programs um, as a way to really teach peaceful conflict resolution. Can you guide us through some of these um, missed opportunities and potential? Yeah, so first we found that the values of restorative practice often did not align with the values of physical education in sports. So, for example, one participant thought that sports and PE should be the, quote, dream area for restorative practice, yet it wasn't connected to sports because PE in sport often had social norms that were not compatible with restorative sports. The participants talked about the, quote, undercurrents of sport and PE, often valuing things like competition in a way that prohibits broader connections to restorative practice which prioritizes building relationships and being more inclusive. In one instance, uh, we interviewed a dean who was in charge of restorative practice at a school. And he remarked that even though he was fully committed to restorative practice throughout the school, he didn't use those values when he served as a volunteer referee uh, for, a, for the school soccer program. So we identified several instances like that where the restorative values didn't connect with the sport or PE context, even in instances where you might expect that it should. Furthermore, we found that sport-based youth development programs were isolated from restorative schools and that school sports and physical education were not designed around relationship building. So in contrast, the schools, uh, design their restorative practices where relationships were the most important aspect and that led to a lack of congruence that prevented these opportunities for holistic integration even at restorative schools where their aim was to actually integrate restorative practice um, throughout the entire school community in some instances participants noted that sports and pe programs mention life skills but that they're not actually about that in their practice, um, not about teaching kids life skills that can apply to everyday life. So however, with that said, um, our participants began to think about what restorative practices might look like in a sport and PE context. So for example, one participant explains that restorative practices, quote, might allow coaches to identify how conflicts and relationships are present and how those relationships are limited by our inability to recognize and address what that means for the team structure. Another participant elaborated to remind us that when kids play sports, players are making mistakes all the time. It's just inherent to sport participation. And so he talked about reframing this notion of harm to think about mistakes. And he says, quote, you made a bad pass. How do you learn from that? And that was really helpful in reminding us that there are a lot of problem-solving opportunities in sports. You know, um, sometimes students make a mistake 
that might receive um, more attention or more blame than other mistakes that were made throughout the game. And so restorative practices provided a mechanism to help uh, coaches and teachers think about those types of things. And that was unique to sports. So those things weren't ha were not happening in classrooms and other school settings. And it does really seem like it is an ideal place to have this conflict negotiation. And it is interesting that you saw that it was disconnected. So through this project, you started to develop the restorative youth sports model. Um, and I think it's awesome. Um, as soon as we talked about this for the first time, I was like, oh, I got to get my hands on this article. And um, so can you kind of break down this model for us? Yes. So there's three components to the model. The first I, I refer to as restorative essentials. I think, this, I think of this as the values level. So the stuff that is routinely a practice in restorative sports programs. This includes taking a relational approach to youth development, building inclusive communication structures, and integrating personal and social skills with sport and physical activity. One of our school partners described this level as like the spirit of restorative practice. So it's that, that thing that you just do um, throughout all of your activities. So the second component is a little bit more specific to practice, and we refer to this as awareness circles. Awareness circles might occur routinely at the beginning and end of a class meeting. Circles provide opportunities for youth to have voice in their program and to focus on building relationships. So as a routine practice, the awareness circle can evolve into a safe space for youth to express themselves. There are a variety of strategies that practitioners can use. So I'll just mention one here to give you a flavor of what this can look like. Um, the example is a, what I call a listening circle. And so a listening circle provides all youth with an opportunity to speak and be heard without judgment. So I might ask a high school PE class in a listening circle to share their thoughts and feelings about sports players who choose to peacefully protest during the singing of the national anthem. By listening to each youth without placing a value judgment on their responses, their perspectives can be affirmed as valuable to our community and space can be created for further constructive conversations. So the third component is we call team meetings. Um, this concept is borrowed from restorative justice conferencing. Team meetings are held periodically in response to a specific team need and includes the youth participants who are directly involved with the relevant issue. I list a few examples for team meetings in the article, including um, to address team strategy and planning, to repair harm to relationships within the team, address team priorities, or to provide opportunities for youth leadership. So here again, there's several practical ways this might apply. I'll try to provide one example here for listeners. A restorative team meeting can apply to a situation where one player makes a big mistake that stands out above other mistakes that naturally occur in sports. I'm thinking of something like a player who misses the free throw at the end of a basketball game or a bad foul that leads to a team losing the game. A team meeting would include the player and team leaders to discuss the specific mistake that was made, how the team might focus on avoiding a mistake like that in the future, but also to place that into its appropriate context, given that a lot of mistakes likely occurred that led to that issue that may be receiving too much attention. The team meeting provides a process where the players can better understand that situation and make sure the relationships on the team remain strong through adversity, which is you know, natural and normal to sport participation. Right. So how would, how would you suggest someone to implement something like this model? There are five suggestions we summarize in the article. First, youth should be gradually empowered. Recognize that youth might not be ready for certain restorative conversations as the examples I provided earlier. So we should start small and find some early wins along the way. Second, try to integrate restorative practices into the sport and physical activities in addition to the awareness circle that might occur at the beginning and end of team meetings. Third, make intentional efforts to address transfer of learning outside of sports. 
that might help to connect the larger school movements focused on building positive relationships. And fourth, emphasize that youth participants are interconnected as members of a team by emphasizing common goals and the importance of each team member's contributions to the team goals. And finally, participants have accountability for their individual actions and their impact on others, and there needs to be fair processes in place to provide that accountability structure. So I guess the question towards the end here is, can this work outside of this great structure in New Zealand that has adopted restorative schools? Yeah, it's a a good question. I think it can work in spaces where the culture is aligned with the core values of restorative practice, primarily focused on building positive relationships. In the United States, there's a growing restorative practice movement and some evidence that restorative practices can help reduce disciplinary problems in schools. I think there will be spaces in the United States for physical educators to connect with the restorative practice movement in their schools. For my part, I think that using restorative practice as an extension of the TPSR model is a way to build on an existing physical education, youth development framework, and demonstrate the importance of physical education and sports within the context of this restorative school movement. My network of teachers and coaches who are already doing this work is growing. I I hope more opportunities to connect are forthcoming. So what are your next moves on this model? Um, Should we expecting this to continue growing in physical education in the USA? Since the publication of this study, I had the opportunity to return to New Zealand to work with a school partner to integrate this work into their physical education and sports programs. As one piece of that visit, I did some research to get the youth perspective on this and get their voice. I'm looking forward to writing about the types of harm and conflicts that youth experience specifically in sport and PE contexts and how restorative practices might be used to address that. Then here at home, we have a partnership with a local high school to implement restorative practices in high school physical education. In North Carolina, one of our essential standards for physical education focuses on peaceful conflict resolution. So we're working with our community partner to do this work in physical education in a way that addresses those state standards. So yes, I do expect that there's opportunities for this work to grow in the future, and I certainly want to be available for people to people who would like to learn more about it. And, and thank you so much for your time. I think the research that you're doing is very valuable and a research of consequence and meaningful. And I, I see a lot of this aligned with the after school programming that we've done and working with uh, this peaceful conflict resolution. And I think, I think this could be a really good model for, for a lot of different scenarios. Um, for those of you that want to read the full article by Dr. Hemphill, um, we've cited in the notes We link to the TPSR Alliance as well on that. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity. Yeah. And so that's all we have for you on this one. Um, Thanks for listening.